Okay, and finally this afternoon we have Dr. Harvey Arbit going to speak with us about the reality of enrollment expectations. Dr. Arbit. It's still morning. And I'm holding you up from lunch, aren't I? Well, you're going to enjoy this next half hour. So we're going to talk a little bit about lasagna's law. How many of you have heard of lasagna's law? That's actually quite a few. Um, we're going to talk some more about it. Most people have never heard of lasagna's law, but when I explain it to them, they go, oh, yeah, we uh, encounter that all the time. All right, so let's start off with the research process. What's the most critical part of the research process? Anybody want to tell me? I'll give you a hint. It's recruiting. What's the most challenging part of the research process? Recruiting. Recruiting. All right. Catching on. And what is the most difficult part of the research to, uh, part to execute? Oh, what, a, what an audience we got here. That's great. They can do clinical research for me anytime. This is wonderful. All right. So we're going to talk about lasagna. And I realize this is near lunch. But we're not going to talk about that kind of lasagna. We're going to talk about that kind of lasagna. So Louis Lasagna was a physician and uh, did a lot of research. Um, and he was the dean of the Tufts University Sackler School of Graduate Biomedical Sciences. But in 1970, Dr. Lasagna made an observation uh, and that observation we'll talk about, and that became known as Lasagna's Law. I had the, the uh, fortunate opportunity to actually have met Dr. Lasagna early in my career, a uh, very interesting individual, um, and uh, we continue to see his law. So what is his law? Lasagna's law, as he stated it, is the number of patients available to join a trial drops by 90% the day a trial begins, and they reappear as soon as the study is over. That was his law, okay? How many of you think this is pretty accurate today? Okay. I guess I don't need to say anything else. All right, so let's look at this in, in a, uh, a pictorial sense here. So we're starting off here. This is, with a, this is the leaky pipe analysis. It was done by Forte Research. They started off with 100 identified patients. And then they did some pre-screening, and they lost some. And then in consent, they lost a few more. At randomization they lost some more. And finally, they only had seven subjects out of the hundred they identified in the beginning. Here's another way to look at this visually. This was from University of Rochester Medical Center. They have a funnel. Starts off with all your potentially eligible subjects. You identify the ones that are potentially eligible, the ones that refer to the study, you go through screening, eligibility is con confirmed, and then you have a few that agree to participate, and then you have to give consent. The study starts. I can't get my hands closer together. All right. And as the study continues, one of the lines that I would have put in here, maybe it goes along with study continues, is dropouts. We have those as well. Then the study completes, and you wind up with maybe, you know, 10 subjects from the 100 or so that you started with. So what helped to create Lasagna's Law? Well, part of it is insufficient preparatory work. Do we really think about 
the population that we have out there or that we're going to have to draw from. Poor estimation of the incidence of the disease that's going to be studied. I mean, if you are a cardiologist and all your patients are cardiology patients, then you probably think the whole world has are cardiology patients, and therefore you have a big population to draw from. And then as you look at the protocol, which you perhaps didn't look at close enough to begin with, all of a sudden it's a certain cardiac disease, a certain age, maybe a certain gender, maybe you can't take certain drugs, and then before you know it, you only have a handful of subjects who are actually eligible for the study. The impact in, uh, of inclusion-exclusion criteria. Lack of motivation on the part of patients to participate. Lack of referrals from, from other providers. Um, the potential burden on the patients. I mean, they're supposed to follow that protocol as well as you are as the investigator. Um, they have to come back every week for a follow-up. Maybe, maybe that's a little bit too much for them and they're not willing to do it. Um, patients are perhaps maybe only want to participate if everything else has failed. But otherwise, they're not interested. Um, unwillingness to participate if they're going to be if there's going to be a placebo arm. Who wants to take a placebo when you could perhaps be treated with this new miracle drug? High cost of finding enough patients for a single trial. It's expensive to identify the subjects to recruit from. So if we're looking for a thousand subjects so we can get a hundred, think about the math that goes in there. So how are studies affected by Lasagna's law. Slow recruitment. You have to extend the recruitment period because subjects are coming in slowly. When I say coming in slowly, yeah, you've identified them, but they get there and all of a sudden they don't qualify anymore. Okay? It extends the entire length of the study because you have to get the patients as they come in. It increases the cost of the, of, of the research. Again, it costs money to recruit the subjects, and then you lose them because they can't be enrolled. If you have a deadline on your grant, oftentimes your funding will run out before you finish your study because you haven't enrolled enough subjects. Maybe you have to discontinue your uh, research because you didn't have enough studies. You can't get any statistical significance. You got you know, three subjects and you were looking for 50. Um, and the interesting part is that the researcher may say, well, now I have unpublishable results. I can't do anything with this. I couldn't finish my study, or maybe I couldn't even start my study. But we'll talk a little bit in a minute about why that shouldn't happen. Then we have ethics. We have ethics in research. So part of it is if you can't get enough subjects into your study, then you have now exposed individuals to an investigational drug for which perhaps we don't know whether it's really safe or effective yet. And they're willing to participate, but nobody else is. So now what happens? You have now, and you, you now have to say, I think I'm going to have to close my study because I can't get enough subjects in here to do my statistics. I'll have no statistical significance. It'll be meaningless. I won't even be able to answer my question. So now you've exposed these individuals to an investigational drug for what? That's, that is an ethical concern. And the risk versus benefit relationship, when you start getting into this problem of actually being able to uh, include enough subjects in there, is actually that flip-flops, and all of a sudden it switches from a greater benefit to a, to a greater risk. Early termination, as I had mentioned, you don't know, you haven't answered your question yet. You, you still, I don't know. I thought this was a good idea. It seemed to work well for me, perhaps, in practice. Now I'm doing research, and I'm trying to prove that it actually works, and you can't. 
And of course, what happens to the subjects who were in the study, you've now had to terminate the study. What do you do with them? Do you continue to treat them? Another ethical question that needs to be answered. Well, where do we see this? You might be thinking, well, in investigator-initiated studies, you've got usually one site. And if you're having trouble enrolling, you can't go to another site and say, maybe you can help enroll some patients so we can increase the population, because there is no other site there. And you think, well, pharmaceutical industry doesn't have a problem with that, because they got lots of money. Yeah, they do have lots of money. But what they also have are the resources to have number of different sites. So if the first site says, sure, we can enroll 50, and then he only enrolled, enrolled 10, maybe the next site will be able to enroll 70. Okay? So they have the opportunity to go to these other sites, and if they go to the mall and they still can't get the right numbers, they can go bring in some more sites. So they've got a lot of dollars so that even though lasagna's law impacts them, they have a way to get around it. Now, they haven't solved anything. They just got around it. So this is another graphical example. This was um, 122 trials that were funded by two public bodies in the UK. So if we look at this, you'll see that 45% of those studies couldn't reach 80% of their enrollment. And if you want to go a half a step further, you say another 25% couldn't even reach 100% of their enrollment. So you can see that this law seems to have an effect everywhere, not just here, but around the world. So let's take another look at those, those same research studies. And now we're going to look at this from the standpoint of early recruitment time. So the first 25% of scheduled recruiting, okay, that was reported to be slower than anticipated in 77 studies. That would be 63%. So if we look at the green, the 24%, fewer eligible patients than expected. The next was 22% with internal problems, staffing issues. The next one at 20%, smaller percentage of patients agreeing to participate than was expected. And it goes on. So you can see just by looking at those three, you now have about 70% that you've lost already. Let's look at this one other way. So now we're taking, again, those same uh, projects, and now we're looking at the uh, last 75% of the recruiting time. And what's interesting here is that fewer eligible patients, internal problems with staff, has external problems, funding issues, conflicts with other trials, you see some similarities. So my question is, if you saw there was an issue up front when you started your study, why didn't you address those issues and fix them so that you wouldn't have them continue and perhaps ruin your study because you couldn't get enough subjects? So here's another visual. So this was a head trauma study, and they had 411 subjects that, were, that they had contacted would be eligible for this trial. Before anything even got started, they had to exclude 177 because they didn't, they, weren't, they didn't meet the baseline requirements. They didn't have the right kind of brain injury. They had no interest in the study. Um, there were other issues that came into effect which you probably wouldn't know unless you really got down and interviewed the patient. Okay, so now that we've lost those 177, we're going to lose another 163 because now they're actually going through the screening. We have 61 
who withdrew because they didn't want to give consent. 23 were lost to follow-up during screening. Another 16 didn't meet the criteria for brain injury. 14 didn't want to travel. And it just goes on. So now you wind up with 71 subjects out of that 411. So one of the things that we always joked about in industry was a research site will recruit half the number of subjects they said they would recruit in twice the period of time. Okay? And that's what the graph looks like. So if you think of it that way, and, and we kind of did that because it was easier to remember than 1910 and all the other kind of stuff that Dr. Lasagna had come up with, but it's easy to, to visualize. You have half the number of subjects in twice the period of time. So in looking at Lasagna's law, the first half of it is the concern. We have a lot of subjects. The study is about to start. And all of a sudden, the stu those subjects disappear. Well, OK, that's fine. But as far as it coming back when the study is over, I have even contacted uh, Tufts and asked them to explain that to me, why it's so important. Because once the study's over, the study's over. I don't care whether all those patients come back again or not. Okay, why, didn't, why did it even have to drop to begin with? You want to avoid that drop. You don't want it to be a 90% drop. Maybe we can decrease that drop to maybe 20% or 30%, certainly better than 90 so what are the current challenges? There have been a number of presentations here at the meeting about recruitment. Excellent presentations. Everybody's got good ideas. And with all those good ideas, we still have issues. So what are some of the challenges? It's a lack of reported reasons for prolonged recruitment. We know what's happening, but where do we find out about it? Premature uh, trial discontinuation due to poor recruitment. Fewer trials report relevant details of the recruitment process. Sure, they'll uh, descri describe in great detail the results of their study, but if they had issues recruiting, you don't usually see that in the, in the report. Why not? I think it's important. Lack of standardized recruitment strategies. I mean, everybody's doing their own thing. Um, insufficient published data uh, and underutilization of, of certain data that's available to us. So here are just some suggestions of things to think about when you're doing um, recruitment. And I really wish I could say to you that it, at the end, I will have a solution to your problem. I don't but maybe these will help you so you don't see a 90% drop. So we can start off with a SWOT analysis. I think probably most or not all of you have seen or have done a SWOT analysis where you're looking at what your strengths and weaknesses are, your opportunities and your, and your threats. And there are questions on there. I won't read them to you. You have them in your slides the kinds of questions you should be asking yourself in each of those four boxes. Then you can take another version of this called the TOES matrix, which is essentially the SWOT analysis, but now it takes advantage of strengths and opportunities, and it looks at internal and external opportunities and weaknesses. So it's a little bit different than the, the SWOT analysis, but a lot of similarities. Advertising strategies, okay? Make a recruitment plan based on previous experiences. For those of you who have been doing research, you've been, you know what has happened previously. What went wrong? How can we change that so it's better for us today? Oftentimes we forget about that. You just look at, oh, I have enough patience for that study but you forget about 
what happened the time before and the time before that where, yeah, you thought you had this patience, but you really didn't. Know your audience. What kind of audience are you going to be addressing and, and recruiting from? Is this a hospital study? Is this a clinic study? Are you going to do this online? Are you going to do physical advertising? What's your, what's your target? You know, the, 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 I guess the millennials and the baby boomers think about things differently. They, I'm attracted to certain things and the you know, millennials and the Gen Xers or whatever they are look at things differently than, than us baby boomers. Maybe you should create an advertising template. Maybe in your institution you get all your recruiters together and you say, hey, let's come up with a recruiting uh, template. What has worked for you? What has worked for you? What has worked for you? Let's bring those all together. Um, talk to other people in, in the field, other physicians, department heads, specialists, recruiting companies. There, are, there were several here in the exhibit hall. So obviously there's an issue with recruiting because people have now made a big business out of recruiting. And they charge you for every patient that's recruited. But guess what? You're going to lose 90% of them before you start your study. Okay? Talk to the IRB. Follow the FDA's uh, recommendations and their and industry guidances. So here's another schematic of looking at different types of media, uh, invitation letters, leaflets, newspapers, internet, television, mailings, emails, and, you know, and it, indi it indicates the relative costs of doing any of those different types of media and who should the population be that you're directing it to. Advertising conversion rate. And in most of the articles that I have read to, to get to this point, they say a 10% conversion rate is a realistic starting point. So for the example is if you're looking to accrue 100 participants, you need 1,000 patients recruited. Okay, so now the next is site enrollment strategies. So all patients are, you can, change your strategy perhaps, and maybe it would help. Here's one which I had never thought of doing, is recruiting all your patients at once, kind of keeping them in the holding block, and then start them all simultaneously. I don't know if that's a good strategy or a bad strategy. It's not one I've ever used, but it was a strategy that was laid out there. Um, do enter the, the patients in batches. So maybe every 10 or 20 subjects, Get those together and start those simultaneously. Um, maybe you just continue to uh, recruit up to a fixed date. When you get to that date, you're done recruiting. Hopefully you will have recruited enough subjects to do your study. Um, what are the methods? You can use media, press releases, internet, cold calls, and so forth. And consider the population and the appropriateness of the cost of that recruitment method that you're going to use. So Bachenheimer had put together five factors contributing to good site enrollment support. So those five factors, as he's described them, is building a community. Trust among your players. There are people in your organization who are doing the same thing you're doing. Maybe you need to talk to them. Maybe you need to form your own little organization to say, look at all the good things we can do and let's put together some kind of uh, criteria for um, recruiting at our institution. Training. You bring people into your recruiting department. Do they really understand what it is to recruit? Do they know how to recruit? To ask the right questions to the right people? Intelligence gathering. Very important. Identify the qualitative and the quantitative information. Um, you need to look at what is being done and qualitative and quantitative. Um, there are issues, some of them are, are, might be hidden in the study. Maybe it's something you didn't recognize when you first wrote your protocol. You need to look for those things. 
Patient recruitment. You, that's your job, patient recruitment. And if your institution is lucky enough to have a department or at least be able to have individuals within departments to recruit, great. That way they can focus on recruiting. The other is to keep those studies in mind. We may not all have the luxury of having one person to recruit for each study. You may have your recruiter re recruiting for maybe six studies. They can't focus on one and forget about the other five. They need to focus on all of them, all of the time. All right. Then we've got guidance documents. The FDA has some great di guidance documents out there. Uh, um, there's a, a, a website down on the bottom of the slide. Uh, also, you've got the E6 GCP talks about recruiting. So there's just two examples, but there's also a lot of literature out there as well. And utilize available technology. So we look at the technology that's been around for a long time, which is basically the structured data. It's age, weight, height, medications, medical conditions, and so forth, which are easy. They're yes, no, A, B, true, false, whatever, okay? That's easy to, to look at. But what we are now being able to see with the increase in our technology and the changes of technology today is the unstructured data, progress notes, discharge summaries, surgical reports, things like that that are not a yes, no, true, false answer. So now if you can get that data along with the structured data, maybe you can start to identify individuals that are better qualified for your study than just looking at, well, we just need women or men or we need this disease or that disease. Well, that's great, but that's too broad. We have to start to focus. Um, SNOMED is something relatively recent, and the FDA is using that. Uh, in INDs, you have to identify using the SNOMED code of what the disease is. So we've got other technologies today that are, we didn't have several years ago. All right, lessons learned. There are some tips here. Utilize information from past experiences. You've all had past experiences, so let's hopefully learn from them and use them. Follow good clinical practice. Uh, estimate the duration of, of uh, the proposal. How much time do you have and make sure that you can do what you need to do in that period of time. So, it, one of the things that was kind of interesting to me as I was thinking about this topic, well, I have a, I have a there was a study that I have, I'm involved with, and we were looking for 100 subjects with a particular ailment. And we had a period of five years to do the study. At the end of five years, we had 16 subjects. The study is going to end with 16 subjects. I don't think there's enough subjects there to get any kind of statistics. We can maybe look at some trends, but that's not going to be good enough. So we're going to start the study elsewhere, but we've learned a lot from what went wrong there, and we're going to make the corrections for the next upcoming study. Um, so I think we all need to just understand that we're all in the same boat. There isn't, I don't think, any institution out here that can say, I need 50 subjects for my study, and they go out and get 50 subjects, and they're done. It, it just doesn't seem to work that way. But if you can go out and if you need 50 subjects, maybe you identify 60 and you use 50. That's a lot more effective than 1,000 to get 100. Questions? <laughs>